Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Barrington and I'm here to welcome you to the latest in the series of the webinars from the management group at the IMACE. Um, previously we've uh, introduced the importance of finance, the engineer, and in this webinar we're going to develop the understanding of how you'd evaluate the business case for a project, a project analysis. Um, this will be led by Christopher Simpson, who is also a, mem a board member of the management group, uh, myself and Tim Podesta. Um, I'd, agree, I'd uh, encourage you to ask any questions as we go along. There are a couple of things to look at, and there is a media download button, which Chris will mention later on. The idea of this is to bring the previous two webinars into the real world a bit more. And the next webinar we're going to do is going to how we link our knowledge of a company's finances and its business state to what strategies we might follow. So linking this into developing strategy. So I'd like to welcome you all again, uh, especially those who have been on the previous webinars, and hand over now to Christopher Simpson. Thank you very much. Project Analysis and the Engineer. My name is Christopher Simpson. Welcome to those of you who have joined us in the two previous webinars, and a special welcome to you who are joining us for the first time. I believe that so far, over 1,500 people have taken part in these webinars. I am the past chairman of the IMECI Management Group, and a current member of the board, as are my colleagues presenting today. The first of our webinars, presented by Paul Ballington, explained the importance of engineers having a basic understanding of finance and set out some of the key areas. This was followed by Tim Podesta, who introduced investment analysis for the engineer and covered the concept of discounted cash flows and his experience with major projects. In this webinar, I wish to build on these previous presentations, this time focusing on a more detailed financial analysis of a real project in which we were engaged. But before I do that, may I just say a few words regarding our management group. The management group at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers aims to support the development of all engineers to maximize their potential, to increase the managerial skills of engineers with a focus on younger engineers making the transition from a mainly technical role into management positions to promote and distribute the best practice in engineering management, to support the young members with their essential management skills conference, provide support and encouragement to the UK engineering sector in general, and encourage and increase a number of, the number of engineers in the most senior leadership roles, both in the private and the public sector. Let me start now by very quickly talking of the main elements in constructing a business plan, of which any project appraisal would be an integral part. So the usual form of a business plan will include a determination of the position of the company in the future markets, the financial returns required from the business, the introduction of new project and rejuvenation of existing products, the definition of new markets and development of existing ones, targets for improved efficiency and quality, and an assessment of risk. Typical areas for improvement are higher output and efficiency, process capability of plant and equipment, changeover times on key machines, level scheduling, simplified documented processes, good materials handling systems, reduced lead times. Cost savings is a key objective. Reducing the cost of quality, employing less direct labor to manufacture products, 
reducing inventory, eliminating unplanned events, machine breakdowns, a particular example, combining operations to reduce product costs, reducing the level of supervision, running new and more efficient machines with higher productivity, and reducing consumable costs, particularly energy. The basic information required for the investment appraisal will uh, obviously include the technical specification for the plant and equipment required, a de definition of any special features required, available area for installation, for expansion of facilities, short list of suppliers, time schedule for the project with key delivery dates, definition of acceptance criteria and process capability, and then obviously the detailed terms and conditions. Further cost considerations will include installation of environmental controls, waste removal and disposal, storage facilities and tooling, tool presetting, oils and consumable items, NC programming, prove out of batches for components, training, a particularly important issue, and planned maintenance requirements and training. The financial data that will be required will include the costs involved and the time schedule to implement, estimated savings over the product life cycle, quantified performance targets, forecasts of sales and revenue, estimation of working capital requirements, cash flow, both capital and revenue, rate of return required from the investment, how the project is going to be funded and the costs involved, risk analysis and a view on exchange rate exposure and the necessity to have a proper insurance in position. I want now to recap on the concepts of the value of money related to time and discounted cash flows. As engineers, I expect you would want to understand the basic maths that supports the methodology. The basic concept of the value of money related to time is that a given amount of cash available in the future is worth less than the amount where it received now. There are three factors involved. The opportunity, funds available now can be invested and produce a return or generate interest. Funds not available until a future date cannot directly be used now. Two, the risks. Funds available now are secure, whereas funds predicted to be available in the future are less certain. A third point, inflation. A sum of money available today will very likely buy more than an equal sum not available until some time in the future. An investment project generates a series of cash inflows or outflows at different future times. The series is called a cash flow stream. The present value of each element of the cash flow stream can be calculated. The sum of these present values is the net present value of the total cash flow stream. The concept of interest that can be earned on funds deposited is, of course, well understood. This can be expressed as the future value, FV, in one year of, say, £100 invested today at an annual interest rate of, say, 5%. And the future value is then 100 times 1 plus 0.05 to the power of 1, giving a figure of £105 or that can be expressed more generally in the equation below. A similar formula can be used to calculate a present value given a future value and a discount rate. 
the present value is equal to the future value divided by 1 plus r to the n, where r is the discount rate. Thus, the value today of a £100 payment arriving in five years in the future using a discount rate of 5% is as expressed below, giving a figure of £75. We move on now to the alternative discount cash flow methods. Net present value, NPV, or the internal rate of return, IRR. The net present value takes the time value of money into account by converting cash flows into present values by multiplying them by the appropriate discount rate. If the NPV is positive, it confirms that the project is profitable because a positive NPV indicates that the project can generate more wealth than an equal sum of money invested in the capital markets at the same risk. The NPV determines the incremental net value added to a business by an investment. It is of particular value when assessing competing projects or when different scenarios in one project are being considered. In other words, where there is an, only a given amount of funds to invest in one or other of the options available. i just give you a further definition of the NPV that we covered a minute or two ago. And here you can see that the net present value is the series of future values um, divided by 1 plus r to the power of n. The internal rate of return, the IRR, is an indicator of the profitability of an investment. It is expressed as a percentage and reflects the timing of cash flows. It cannot be calculated directly and requires a process of iteration to achieve a result. But the use of Excel or similar software makes the calculation simple. It does not use discount rates, that's market discount rates. And here is the formula that defines the internal rate of return. As you see, the internal rate of return is defined as the discount rate that makes the net present value NPV, NPV of all cash flows from a project equal to zero. In effect, to find the IRR, it is necessary to reverse engineer what rate is required so that the NPV equals zero. The discount rate. The effect of the discounting depends on two factors, the actual discount rate employed, the amount of time between now and each future net cash inflow, the number of discounting periods. As the number of discounting periods between now and the cash arrival increases, the present value decreases. As the discount rate in the previous, in, sorry, in the present value calculations increases, the present value also decreases. Most companies use their own cost of capital or weighted average cost of capital as the preferred discount rate. In its simplest terms, the rate can be based on the spot interest rates adjusted for tax. It's common to add an after-tax risk premium to the basic rate, i.e. to use a higher discount rate for higher risk investments and a lower discount rate when expecting returns from a proposed investment are seen as exhibiting a lower risk. The higher rate is viewed as a hedge against risk 
because it attaches relatively more emphasis on returns achieved in the earlier periods compared to future returns. I will now move on to the main part of this webinar and describe to you the financial appraisal of a real project in which we were engaged. The industrial sector is not revealed and a small amount of the data and the timing has been changed to protect confidentiality. Some simplifications relating to depreciation and taxation have also been made. The background is that a long-established company with its manufacturing operations based in the center of a town realized that the land it occupied had a high potential value for redevelopment to include houses, a supermarket, and a hotel. The funds that could be generated from the sale of the land were expected to be sufficiently substantial to finance the construction of an entirely new works on the outskirts of the town on land made available by the local authority. The objective was to achieve a modern, efficient, and highly flexible new manufacturing facility equipped with the latest plant and machinery. The products that the company manufactures are basically similar, but there are a large number of variants, so orders are all different and with volumes ranging from a batch size of one to some hundreds of units. Flexibility was a key, and it was decided at an early stage to utilize RFID, that's radio frequency identification, as an integral part of a sophisticated production control system. The plant and machinery required has lar had largely to be sourced from European manufacturers, as sadly no company in the UK could offer the required technology. Some of the more modern machines in the existing works were, however, reutilized. Very careful planning was required to ensure production was maintained as far as possible during the transfer from the existing to the new works. As you can see here, fundamentally the aim was to improve productivity, improve quality, reduce lead times, and gain flexibility and hence to improve service to customers, secure a good future for the employees, and to generate higher profits for the business. Inevitably, such an objective resulted in a reduction in direct labor costs. But because the company is part of a larger group, many of the employees who would otherwise have been adversely affected could be offered employment elsewhere. Also, as will be seen, as the project progressed, new recruitment was required, albeit for a much more highly trained and skilled people, set of people. In parallel with all the engineering planning, it was essential at each stage to ensure financial viability. For this purpose, a financial model was constructed, incorporating all the main elements, and from this, cash flow forecasts were made to allow the MPV of the project to be calculated. In practice, a number of different scenarios were developed, and in each, different assumptions were made regarding future revenue growth, productivity, number of shifts worked, etc. All these scenarios were compared, not least the scenario of, do, of the do-nothing option. It is very important when preparing cash flow forecasts to ensure that they are so constructed that they allow any changes in assumptions to cascade through the spreadsheet. This allows different scenarios and assumptions easily to be considered. For the purpose of this presentation, I trust you understand that it is only practical to provide information on one of the many scenarios considered. And even this is a real challenge, as the spreadsheets are relatively large and do not permit inclusion on one slide. I've therefore elected to show the cash flow calculations in a number of sections that I hope will be comprehensible to you. It is common practice to depreciate plant and machinery over a period of seven years, 
and land and buildings uh, over 20 years or in many cases not at all, dependent on the prevailing tax allowances. So in this case, we constructed the financial model and the cash flows over a period of seven years. But remember that depreciation rules are complex with 100% first-year allowances being possible for given amounts of money for plant and machinery, research and development, and further allowances are possible in assisted areas. Possible government grants are a further consideration. The build-up of the cash flow needs carefully to be designed, as will be seen in the following slides. Now, I apologize, as I said, that the slides are somewhat difficult to read and are congested. And I would suggest that you hit the Resources tab, and this will allow you then to download the following four slides. So the first part is the cash flow forecast covering revenue, materials, and labor. At the top, you will see there is an estimation of the number of sets that will be sold in 2019. And this, together with an average cost, allows the revenue to be established for the year 2019. We already had the budget for 2017. We did a, a separate a, a appraisal for 2019. We then move down to the line where you can see the uh, revenue set out, and below that, the, material, the variable costs, starting with the materials which were, these costs were separately assessed. Moving down, we then made a pro rata manning assessment uh, based on a, a, a given level of productivity. We then made assumptions regarding the improvement in productivity that could be realized and this then allowed us to calculate the labor saving that would be possible. So then the following line is the revised labor estimates, which when multiplied by the average cost gave us the total labor cost involved. So we have the revenue, we have the material costs, and we have the direct labor. This allows the gross profit, defined as revenue less materials and labor, to be calculated. It will be seen at the gross profit level that the returns on the project already look encouraging. We move now to the second part of the cash flow forecast, which covers further variable costs and hence allows us to calculate the contribution. Other variable costs include things such as repair and maintenance, consumables, power, transport, etc. All of the variable costs are then added together to give the total variable costs. By deducting the total variable costs from the revenue, we arrive at the contribution. In other words, the amount of funds generated that contribute to the fixed costs of the business. We'll now look at the fixed cost side. The definition of what constitutes fixed costs is always somewhat subjective and is dependent on the time scale. But in this particular case, we elected to consider staff costs as essentially fixed. The highly trained and skilled engineering and marketing staff are a major asset for the company. In strict accountancy terms, the depreciation is a non-cash item. But for the purposes of this project analysis, it is regarded as part of the fixed costs. 
the assumptions made on depreciation can have a significant impact on after-tax profitability. We finally come to the last part of the cash flow. This covers the total fixed and variable costs. We now have the total of these costs, which when deducted from the revenue, results in the earnings before interest and tax. This in turn allows us to obtain the cash flow from the operations by adding back the depreciation. As I said earlier, depreciation is a non-cash item. So below the net ca the cash flow from the operations, we now have to include the capital costs. And these are, of course, uh, calculated on a large separate spreadsheet, but then could be moved over to be included here. So this was a question of establishing the costs and then the time schedule as to when these costs were incurred. From all this, the cash flow stream produces the net value, present value that can be calculated, assuming differing cash flow discount rates. In both the case of the NPV and the IRR, the values were simply determined using the appropriate Excel formula. The final line is the cumulative cash flow. All of this data is then presented graphically. As it will be seen, the cumulative cash flow is forecast to reach zero in mid-2020, the so-called break-even point. This is of relevance, but I would strongly encourage you not to use the so-called break-even analysis alone as it is fundamentally flawed. It ignores the cash flow and hence profitability of an investment after the break-even point has been reached. It provides no measure of overall profitability and it is totally misleading when comparing competing investment projects. Summary of results. With this particular scenario, at a discount rate of 14%, the NPV was shown to be just over 9 million. This is equivalent to an internal rate of return of 28.6% on the initial investment of nearly 23 million. These results were substantially in advance of the internal hurdle rates set by the parent company. Other scenarios were less positive, but overall the analysis showed a strong positive return on the investment. Thus, approval was given to proceed. Conclusion. In the limited time available, I trust you've been able to gain an insight, an initial insight, as to how a real investment project can be analyzed. We look forward very much to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to Christopher's webcast. Um, I think that all of those amongst us who are engineers, obviously, will recognize the power of the uh, mathematics presented. And we'd like to invite any questions now. Uh, I'm sure there are quite a few. And we've got an initial question, which is discussing the power of these mathematics and how, what care we've got to take in picking the uh, discount rates and the hurdle rates and making sure that that doesn't lead us to make the wrong conclusions. So if uh, Christopher and Tim could have that, and then I'll add in any uh, comments towards the end of that question. Yes, Paul, thank you. If I may come in briefly. Um, obviously, the selection of the hurdle rates and the discount rates is very dependent upon the type of industry that one is involved with. 
Um, so it's not possible to give general recommendations. Um, as I said in the uh, pre presentation, normally um, companies would use as a discount rate their own cost of capital. Um, also, it's possible to make changes to this to assess the sensitivity. And usually what is done is to not adopt one single discount rate or one hurdle rate, but to look at a number and see what the sensitivity is in terms of the resulting net present value or the internal rate. But um, Tim, perhaps you'd like to develop that theme a little further from the perspective of BP. Hello? Uh, Chris, it sounds like we've lost Tim at the moment. So uh, if, if I step in on that one from my background is I, I'm usually uh, analyzing projects and deals that are in the time frame of 10 to 35 years, usually more towards the 25, 30 year period. And it is one of the most important questions really this, so, which is why I put it to the top of the list. Um, because you're not only, depending how you, you, you model this, you're applying the discount factor not only to um, uh, revenues that you might get, future revenues for risk, etc. But you're also applying them towards future costs. And uh, so you have to make sure that you're not understating your future costs um, because you're treating them as being as risky as, as future revenues and they may not be. So my personal view is hurdle rates are quite dangerous if they're misused. Yes, um, you're absolutely right, Paul. And if I might make a, a slightly political comment at this stage, that uh, we do a lot of business internationally and we find that uh, a problem in the UK is uh, setting unrealistic, unrealistically high hurdle rates. And so, frankly, it results in very many projects being put forward but which never see the light of day uh, because main boards demand, as I said, unrealistically high hurdle rates. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's another aspect to this as well, of course, is that if you're working a very long-term relationship between two corporations or businesses, then knowledge of each other's cost of capital um, can identify genuine arbitrages that add value to both parties. But it's a mass, I think my, my emphasis to people is it's a, a massively powerful technique you, you can mislead yourself in thinking that something that is a bad investment when actually it's good. And also you can mislead yourself into thinking that future costs are lower than they actually will be. But the, the main thing is, is that it's a very flexible technique when, when used properly. And, uh, 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 and if people haven't used this methodology, I would encourage them to have a look at it, have a play with it, and see how it changes uh, the outcomes of it. The decisions. Okay, um, so the next question we've got is um, how can we, uh, and it probably follows on that same theme, uh, Christopher and Tim, it's about how can we take it, uh, account of environmental concerns such as cost of carbon and carbon offset schemes into the analysis. And, I would think this actually plays to its strengths, but over to Chris and Tim. Yes, Tim, are you on the line now? No, seemingly not. Yes, uh, I am. Oh, great, great. Would you like to pick this up then and I'll follow if necessary? Well, certainly in terms of taking into account uh, the cost of carbon, one assumption that can be made is is whether the carbon tax might be applicable to the particular investment analysis or there may be some um, desire to pay for some offsetting scheme 
very much depends, uh, in my experience, on, on two things. One is the, the corporate policy. There may well be some corporate guidance on what may need to be used. And in, in my experience, the, there was guidance on using a, a, a certain dollar per tonne as a, a, a tax on carbon to be taken into account. And then the other thing may be the view on the regulations that may apply particularly now and in the future, and that may require another aspect of investment analysis, and that's looking at the scenarios and, and, and how you know, the uh, particular project in, in, in mind might be might fare under different uh, future scenarios, particularly longer-term ones. Okay, so a very quick technical one, Chris. Um, um, the uh, Darren has asked us, can we clarify what hurdle rates are? Um, for, for political correctness, I don't think I'll answer that question because I love them deeply. But it's over to you, Chris. Yes. Uh, essentially, the hurdle rate is for the company to define what is the minimum rate of return that they would require from the investment, having taken into account the risk factors. So fairly obviously, uh, the very minimum hurdle rate would be a rate of return equivalent to the cost of money. And that I referred to in the presentation. What one often finds is that there are competing projects for a given amount of funding available. And one of the great advantages of using discount cash flow te techniques is that one can make a valid comparison between differing projects, probably with different levels of investment over different timescales. And this gives a very clear indication of which is the more preferable project when there is only funds available, shall we say, to finance one of them. I hope that gives you some indication of the approach that's taken. Yeah. Um, Innocence has asked a question here, uh, Chris and Tim, which uh, I think links together several other questions about how you run sensitivities. Uh, uh, and, and what you're looking for besides just the MPV number. So what Innocence is asking is for engineers like, uh, like uh, herself, uh, cash flow stroke or, or return on investment is, re is a rarely considered subject. Um, and I'm just losing the rest of the script on the question. Uh, but... Um, And she's saying that looking at calculation, it's clearly key. I mean, one of the things that MPV gives you is it, it gives you the uh, uh, an automatic balancing of the cash flows, early cash versus later cash. Could you expand on that a bit, on how we look at sensitivities in IRR and, and MPV? Tim, do you want to go on this, or shall I? I can make a start, and you... So, so my experience is that, that sensitivities are normally defined around the key assumptions that are being made. And going back to the earlier presentation, the previous webinar where we looked at the areas of assumptions, and clearly the key ones are around the sort of range of costs that may be may be incurred, or or the range of potential start-up dates or delivery dates for a project, and probably most importantly, the range of, of scenarios which may apply in the future in, in terms of revenue and, and other factors. And my experience is in finding a way of showing these visually, whether it's, it's sometimes referred to as spider diagrams or tornado diagrams, where you actually show to the decision maker the the range of potential outcome. Normally, in terms of NPV, that tends to, that's probably the, the most comparable thing. And 
in those MPV ranges will then give the decision maker a particular uh, insight into, well, what is the risk that is being taken in this investment? And the, the, from my previous webinar, there is one particular test which I find very helpful, and that's the 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 range or scenario which will give you effectively a neutral investment, a zero MPV investment. That can be a very interesting and useful test. Uh, under what circumstances would the investment just in effect uh, wash its face and come out with a effectively zero MPV? So th that, that, that would be my input on scenarios. Yes, I, I think that covers it very effectively. Uh, as we've said, the very fact that we're considering scenarios automatically provides you with an, a sensitivity analysis. So, as Tim said, um, make an assumption about the worst case revenue that can be expected from the project and then look progressively at more optimistic outlooks and then see how that affects the NPV um, from the project. That, that sounds good. I, I mean, I'd just like to expand on that with just one, I think, cautionary word, is now with cheap computing power, it's pretty cheap to run multiple scenarios and test your assumptions you're making. As Tim has said, uh, if you've got an assumption about cost, um, when it was harder to calculate these things, you would have used a technique like Monte Carlo analysis to come out with the most likely cost. Now, Monte Carlo not done well will just tell you the number you originally thought of. So it can be far better to put pessimistic, worst case scenarios in and just see how bad each costs have to be to send you negative. Um, and, the, uh, and, and this, I think, is one of the powers of the technique. And the fact that you can run it on something similar, simple like Excel gives you a, gives you a good approach. Um, I would give one word of warning on using spreadsheets for this. Be careful how you set up the MPV calculation. It's terribly easy to get it wrong, particularly using some of the pre-coded MPV commands. So I would say always know the formula and check the answer you're getting out of the spreadsheet if you've got it right, because you can get some very big errors very fast. Um, we've, we've got a follow-on question from Nicholas on, uh, on hurdle rates, Chris and Tim. Um, and he's saying, uh, but can't those lower hurdle rate projects also be used as, as contribution margins? So my response is, of course, yes, they can. It's a matter of, um, basically, it, it, it's, a, it's a picking list or a pecking order of where you want to invest your money. But over to you on picking think, projects below the hurdle rate or at the hurdle rate. Yes, um, this is an area where I tend to focus quite sig significantly. Um, if we look at the history of UK manufacturing over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen until relatively recently a tendency to outsource to so-called low labor cost countries. And one of the problems in my assessment is that companies didn't look at existing activities or indeed new activities, and define the contribution um, that would be made to the fixed costs which the, country, the company inevitably has to carry. And basically, if you have sufficient capacity, then any activity that produces a contribution to the fixed costs means that you should retain that activity because if you outsource, it's highly likely that the fixed costs remain largely as they were and you have even less contribution to cover them. Mm -hmm. So I purposely 
when I was illustrating the cash flow slides, made an em em put emphasis on that contribution line. It is very important. Yes, Chris, I'd agree when I was working in corporate recovery as a consultant. I saw that time and time again where um, there was a bias in the decision process, taking process to the latest uh, management trend and low cost sourcing was one of those powerful trends. Uh, that and uh, large integrated IT systems. Uh, it almost created a blindness to the fact that um, you were going to be struggling to cover your fixed costs. Uh, just running down the, the anything for you to add on that, uh, Tim? Yes, that reminds me of a particularly important principle in looking at investment. It's not just looking solely at the investment that you've got in mind, the project in mind, but what, what's the alternative? And it's quite often the case when you think, well, if I don't do this investment, or if I do, what 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 is the knock-on effect? What's the impact on other cash flows? So that would be another way of, of, of referring to the impact on contribution is, is what, what what's the alternative to the project I'm looking at? Yes, and, and certainly the do-nothing scenario can be seen as a dangerous comfort zone because people tend to assume things will just keep going along as they ever did. Um, one thing I'd point in, into this is that some of the biggest companies are built out of initial business cases that have negative MPV. And so the fact that you don't get to uh, a surplus on your MPV calculations is not always the case when you're looking into a disruptive technology and innovation. It may actually start off quite negative. And so those are some of the biggest decisions companies have to make. Uh, just Paul, just, could I just stop. very briefly come in? I see that there are a number of questions asking if copies of the slides can be made available. And I think we have advised the individuals that yes, yeah. we can do this, but could we perhaps just make the general point to all of our listeners, if they wish to um, have copies of the slides, this can be facilitated. Great, yes, of course, but, uh, so you've effectively done that. <laughs> um, so yes, we will share slides. If you email the IMEC uh, and mark it as the management group webinar, um, it'll find its way through to us. Um, there's a question here, I'm, I'm looking at here, which looking at uh, uh, Bongani uh, uh, has asked a question here, which is how would we incorporate macroeconomic, political, commercial and contractual risks into our analysis? Um, that sounds like something that Tim was talking about on the last seminar. So Tim, could you recap a bit? Well, certainly when you look at the overall context for a project or investment, you would you'd look to see consideration of, of all those things you mentioned, both in in making the strategic case for investment, how it fits with the company strategy, but also in, in, in how you would effectively monetize or or make your cash flow assumptions associated with a particular investment, it, w it may affect the the likely uh, duration of the project. It may affect the even the uh, some of the currency considerations, uh, and it may even affect some of the uh, even the cost of capital. You may need to um, take into account uh, some of the risks associated with a. Uh, particular context. Um, those sort of things are very much what I describe as a corporate decision rather than a project specific decision. And, and I would look to to seek guidance on those from uh, so the, the, the corporate teams as part of the making a case for investment. And Christopher, how would you think about that one? 
Yes, um, I think that what Tim has said um, within the time that we've got available very effectively covers it. I mean, it is a huge topic in its own right. And uh, if I might suggest, Paul, bearing in mind the large number of questions that I'm seeing up at the screen, on the screen, I think we should rest with the comments that uh, Tim has just made, which I think are very good. Yes, uh, I, I suppose the, if somebody wants to do some background reading, they can have a look at techniques like real options uh, might be a way of getting into that as well. Uh, so you create a decision tree. Um, interesting question from Sam. Um, um, Sam basically asking that uh, if you've got a company where currently they don't have a formal process for, for project evaluation, what would you recommend is the best place to start? Um, well, my answer to that, Paul, is if you're not using NPV and cash, uh, looking at the cash flow from prospective projects, do so as quickly as you can. Um, I've emphasized in this presentation uh, the appraisal of building a new factory, but the techniques that I've outlined are equally applicable if, for instance, you're considering buying a single machine tool. The techniques are just the same and equally important, whether it's a major project for um, a factory, uh, whether it's something uh, such as Tim and Paul are involved with where its project's going out 30 years. All of these different uh, investment opportunities should be covered by a detailed NPV analysis. As I said briefly in my presentation, um, we're, we're, we're bedeviled in this country by investment projects being analysed just on the basis of break-even. In other words, how long does it take to get your initial money back? But it produces very erroneous results. As I said, it ignores completely the cash that is generated following the break-even point being reached and therefore prevents you making comparisons between competing projects. So if we achieve only one thing today, it's to encourage all of you to aim to cover all of the investment projects that are coming up with your business and analyze them using discount cash flow methods. And, and, and I would augment that as well, Christopher. From my experience in corporate recovery where you are going into companies that have got into trouble with taking on contracts or making uh, capital investments that had gone wrong. Um, it was usually those sort of medium to long term decisions that were the root of the problem. And these, it, these analyses needn't be massively, massively complicated. They can be quite simple. And, but the main thing is be prepared for a shock. Um, either pleasant or unpleasant, but at least you'll know what to do about it. Okay, um, we've got a question here. I don't know whether we're common, how, whether we're qualified to answer, uh, but certainly we can relay it on to the report of this institute. But uh, does anybody on the panel know anything about how HS2 was analysed? I had a quick look at the economic case. Uh, but that didn't really go into the uh, analysis of the uh, of the capital investments. Um, or should we try and uh, track, um, uh, direct this question to somebody else in the institute? Uh, yes, Paul, I, I have no direct knowledge. I mean, the fact that it, apparently the costs have more or less doubled before they've even effectively started um, does raise some worrying questions as to how the initial appraisal was undertaken. And we've had repeatedly questions about sensitivity. Uh, one gets the impression that um, uh, the, the analysis initially was perhaps as not rigorous as it should have been. But um, 
uh, we have a railway division with the institution, within the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and colleagues who I think are probably far better qualified than we are to uh, answer that question. If you could send us an email, we're very happy to pass it on. Okay. Um, yes, and I'd add on to that. The, the part of the coverage that confused me a bit, and I was surprised by, was that um, not by the fact it was in the HS2 business case, but that people didn't understand it, was the fact that when you evaluate these deals, you have to pick an economic year to evaluate them against. And so HS2 was all evaluated against either 2014 or 2015 economics. And uh, they were trying to make quite a big thing that uh, these numbers were for 2015, and why are you doing that in 2020? Well, it's one of the, hopefully you'll start to see that with MPV, you've got to pick a, a, a year zero that you compare everything to. Otherwise, you get very rapidly lost in the, in the calculations. Um, we've got a question here from uh, uh, which is about liquidated damages in financial modelling for for project bidding. Um, how do you feel about that one, Christopher and Tim? So, liquidated damage clauses in the contract. How to uh, how to evaluate those? Well, make an estimate in the worst case as to what those liquidated damages could be and build it into the cash flow and see what the effect is of so doing. Oh. And, and Tim? Yes, that would be a sensitivity which would be, um, I would say, um, prudent to make. Um, and also a test as well, if you were agreeing the amount of liquidated damages, both what would be required to make up for any potential loss, but also what could be borne by by whoever was um, likely to have to pay. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, liquidated damages is a matter of making sure your engineering team have, have, have done a good enough job to evaluate the risk you're standing by that clause. And you've got good probability numbers around you. Um, but in general, I, uh, you know, and this is just my belief, it's better to ha have liquidated damages in a contract than have risks that are at large. At least you've got a starting point for the argument. Yes. Uh, it, 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 in other words, Paul, uh, you're trying as far as possible to define the level of the risk. If you have an open contract... Um, well, my response being slightly provocative is you're playing poker with the business. Yes, and capping that level of exposure as well. And, Indeed. Uh, exactly. Um, and their insurance, of course, can come in as well. Yes, yes. Um, I, I like to use the analogy here of um, if you're a local uh, pump maintenance company, and you're doing maintenance on an oil refinery pump, you're doing a $500 job. Um, the pump goes wrong and shuts the refinery down. Um, how could it be, you know, reasonably, okay, you've caused the problem that's, that's lost $100 million of production, say, um, but you've got to have something that defines and stops your liability for that. And you should put that number in your business case. If you think you're going to do it once every 10 years, you should have that, the cost of doing it once every 10 years in your business case. Um, just looking at the remaining questions, I think we're getting to the point where we've covered the main area. Um, I'd like to just do a final call for any other questions that, uh, before we start to wrap up. A bit like an online auction, you're waiting for that last question that somebody's waiting to press the button on. Um, again, we've got more real questions about sharing the presentation, and again, yes, it will be available if you email the IMECE, and these webinars are also available online from the IMECE after the after the record after the live event. So I say. Um,
There's another question here from, uh, obviously this is something that's hitting quite a, uh, a theme here, which um, uh, Bruno is asking again about the, and the question just disappeared for a moment, uh, but again he was asking about the uh, um, making the, uh, the inputs and outputs realistic in MPV calculation. Um, and yeah, he says so, sometimes okay. management boards use too optimistic forecasts and scenarios to convince stakeholders that projects are better than they actually are. Um, yeah, that's the removing bias is, is 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 an important part of the process of governance. Um, I think Tim, you did quite a good piece on that, talking about your experience at BP. Yes, and I would I was going to say uh, my short answer to this is is. Um, having good conversations about the assumptions. So at the end of the day, the inputs and outputs are based on assumptions and they need to be um, robust and, ch and fairly challenged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, any final comments from Christopher before we have to wrap up? Because we're just coming up to one o'clock and the end of our slot. Yes, I, I'm just... Um slightly regretful that there are still a number of very, very interesting questions that uh, yeah. time is not going to allow us to cover. There's a question here uh, asking to expand in more detail on depreciation costs and why they're subtracted. All, all I can say is, I think it's Nuno, if you'd like to make contact with the institution, I'm very happy to pick that up uh, outside this webinar, and that applies to all of you, where time, unfortunately, has not allowed us to cover the questions, all of the questions, as we would have otherwise so wished to do. Yes, yeah, so generally where there are comments like, like Nuno's comment, and I must admit I put it into the priority question box and missed it. Apologies, Nuno. Um, and again, the, the, uh, the, the question from Sam about where do you start in all this. Uh, do feel free to reach out to the manage group, management group board members and uh, we'll help you point, put you in the right direction as far as we're allowed to. Um, so it just goes to, falls to me to thank everybody for dialing into the webinar today. Uh, to thank Christopher for the work he's put in preparing the presentation and sharing a real business case with the factory relocating from the city centre out into a new purpose-built facility. And for Tim Podesta create, bringing his experience from BP and providing continuity from the last webinar. We had some very good questions today which are about how this influences the future directions of companies and how powerful it is. Our next webinar is aiming to bridge slightly away from the financial area into strategy. But to pick the right strategy, you need to know where you are and you need to know how good these options you've got in your, available to you for a future strategy are. So we're going to do a, a numerate approach to strategy and it will probably use a framework that basically looks critically at the company's strategic position and what its options are. Um, so once again, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to the team at uh, the IMEC -E and uh, to WorkCast for providing the uh, platform we work on. Uh, thank you to Chris and Tim. And I hope to see you all on the next webinar, which looks at taking this into, okay, now I know what, what the situation is. What do I do? Thank you all very much. <laughs>